we've really gotten to see Iran become a major player on the world stage in the last couple of years, uh, working and making partnerships in various regions. So before we get to the obvious discussions about Gaza, um, I'd like to take a closer look at some of the other areas Iran is working in. Um, so in 2021, President Raisi said that Latin America had become a priority for Iran in which to expand its influence and sphere of action. And he traveled there in June of last year. Iran has recently been accused of cozying up to the socialist regimes of Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Cuba, and providing them with weapons and military support. What exactly is Iran doing in Latin and South America, and what partnerships should we look for this year? I think it's important to keep in mind that um, there has been a lot of overlap between Iran and the revolutionary movements in Latin America in the sense that they were anti-imperialist and um, also uh, most political parties and factions in Iran are left-leaning. So social justice issues in Iran uh, are also important. And the revolution in Nicaragua and the revolution in Iran uh, happened almost simultaneously. So after the revolution, Iran began to establish close ties with Cuba, with uh, Nicaragua, and later on after President Chavez came to power with Venezuela as well, but also it has very good relations with a host of different countries like Brazil. Right now, the uh, the president has had a historically good relationship with Iran. In general, Iran's policy has always been to uh, strengthen ties with countries in the global south, and uh, Latin America is very much a part of that. Uh, ever since the United States began to increase pressure on Venezuela, the Iranians began to get more involved there, and they helped them restore their electricity as well as uh, their um, petrochemical plants and refineries, uh, So, and in other areas as well. So uh, Venezuela has helped Iran whenever it was possible for it to do so, and Iran has always tried to help Venezuela in any way possible as well. So the relationship between Iran and many of these countries um, is not new, but President Raisi, when he came to power, his policies were a bit different from, or substantially different from his predecessor, and he, I think, focused more or focuses more on the global south than the previous administration. It's really, really interesting to watch Iran kind of making moves, especially with Venezuela and the oil and that border dispute that they have going on right now. Um, and so in January, January of this year, actually, uh, Iran's vice president went uh, met with Niger's prime minister. Um, for our listeners that may not know, Niger went through a coup uh, recently, uh, replaced their government with a military uh, administration. And um, obviously the West is not happy about that. It, uh, it resulted in the ousting of the French. And now we're looking at them tr maybe ousting the Americans. Um, so at this meeting, uh, the vice president expressed Iran's desire to aid Niger, Niger's current government in combating sanctions. Um, he said, Iran condemns the cruel sanctions that are imposed by the domination system. We will definitely share the experiences we have in this field with our brothers from Niger. In the last two weeks, Niger has suspended its status of forces agreement signed in 2012. That allowed 1,000 U.S. military personnel and civilian defense staff to operate in the country. Iran also supports Mali and Burkina Faso, two other states that are in the region in the Sahel that have ousted their West-leaning governments for military administrations. Uh, Western analysts are very worried that they will soon see shaheds in, in, in Niger. But what can we expect from Iran in the Sahel region? And are they helping these sort of new military, they call them the young lions, the young lions of the Sahel kind of get their colonizers out of their countries? Yes, we have to keep in mind that the um, independence that African countries were able to achieve uh, 
uh, did not end uh, neocolonialism. And the Europeans, the Americans, and the French in particular, they've been exploiting Africa um, ever since independence. Nothing really has changed. And that's why these countries remain so poor. The, the, the countries were not democratic. They were utterly corrupt. And the Western powers were able to install the people uh, in power that uh, they wanted so that they could exploit the, co the continent's resources for themselves. And that hopefully is gradually coming to an end. And uh, in some of these countries where we've seen these military coups, the new leaders want a better deal for their people. And they're looking for alternatives. They want to have good relations with uh, countries across the globe so that there's no monopoly uh, in, in, in their countries. And uh, Iran, because of it, the experiences that it has had over the last four decades, and uh, because of the sanctions, largely because of the sanctions, uh, and because Iran has been able to develop uh, its own technology, it's, it's, it's a leading country in many high-tech fields. Uh, and of course, as we all know, Iran's military industry is probably now the third, fourth best in the world technology-wise when it comes to drones and missiles and, and many other uh, types of weapons. So Iran has a, a lot to offer, although uh, Iran has priorities uh, and uh, a unlimited resources because of the sanctions, but also because our region is, uh, meaning West Asia, is uh, very uh, uh, you know, it's facing many problems and the crises, uh, but still Iran does have the capability to help these countries to a degree uh, alongside its friends in Latin America. Now we're going to move back over to South Asia. So um, in January, <laughs> Iran and Pakistan kind of exchanged some artillery fire, missile fire. And for those of the, for the, the world, for people in the world that don't know, they were freaking out thinking Iran was going to war with Pakistan. So that was a lot of fun. But um, so they, they, they both claim to target these Baloch separatists. Uh, both countries' foreign ministries released statements, and they both said, we respect the territorial integrity of the other, but we have to take measures to safeguard our national security. The whole thing kind of sort of went by without a ton of noise, but that's probably because Westerners have no clue what Balochistan is. So could you maybe shed a little bit of light on that, that sort of cooper cooperation between Pakistan and Iran? And is it safe to assume that these separatists are being activated to prevent cooperation between I Iran and Pakistan and the gas pipeline, and which is ironically named the peace pipeline? Yes, uh, that um, the border situation with Pakistan is a bit complicated. Um, because there, there were two types of terrorist activities that took place in Iran through the Pakistani border. One was the ISIS attack a few months ago that killed uh, roughly 100 Iranians uh, during the anniversary of General Soleimani, uh, who was murdered by Trump. Uh, he led the fight on the ground against ISIS, both in Syria and Iraq. So, and of course, that ISIS attack, uh, as a result, Iran bombed uh, or struck with their positions with missiles in Syria. But uh, the relationship between ISIS and Western intelligence agencies is another matter. And, uh, you know, as right now people are discussing it again because of the uh, attack in Moscow. Uh, because we had a similar outrage in Moscow to what we had in Kerman in Iran. In Iran, almost 100 people were killed. In Moscow, 142, three people at least were murdered. But um, in addition to that, we have another group, uh, another set of attacks. And that attack was carried out by ISIS. And the other terror attacks were carried out by 
a separatist group that's based in Pakistan. So both of both both uh, groups use the Pakistani border to carry out terror attacks inside the country. And the problem is that Pakistan is a very weak country. It's, uh, its economy is broken, it's poor, and the government doesn't have much control over the border region with Iran, especially since its military is focused on India. It puts most of its resources there. And also it has a very long border with Afghanistan and it has lots of problems with the Taliban. They have differences over the border and it's complicated. Uh, we also have problems with our border with Afghanistan, but in any case, pa Pakistan has been going through many crises over the last few decades. And of course, the more recent crisis, crisis that we've seen during the election period and previous to that when Imran Khan was arrested and his part, party dismantled officially. Uh, the country, in other, in other words, has many problems and therefore a no man's land sort of exists uh, uh, in the Pakistan, on the Pakistani side of the border. So these terrorists are, or have been able to use that absence of government, of, of state institutions, to create infrastructure for themselves, bases, use it, and they use those as to uh, to prepare themselves for attacking inside Iran. Uh, so, so almost simultaneously, we had two attacks. One was the ISIS attack, where the uh, which came through Pakistan, but then we also had the separatist attacks. And these separatists, I wanted to stage another attack. They were on the verge of carrying out another attack. They had gathered to move towards the Iranian border, and Iranian intelligence discovered that. So the regional military commander had to make a choice. Either he waited for them to attack, because uh, there was no way for them to, there was no time to inform this government and then for the government to contact Pakistan and then the Pakistani government uh respond it would have been too late so he took a decision to strike um the the, uh, the terror base where they had gathered with uh with a drone with at least one drone i don't know if it was one drone or more i don't recall but in any case a, a significant number of these people were killed i think roughly 15 or so but this wasn't supposed to be publicized <laughs> and what happened was that a media outlet in iran published this news and if they hadn't done so the pakistani government wouldn't have responded in that way because it was right it was two weeks before the pakistani elections yes and so there's a drone strike inside pakistani territory the, the armed forces is in charge of the country doesn't look good for them. So it created a, a lot of anger in Pakistan, which was understandable. And the Pakistani government or armed forces responded by striking uh, Pakistanis inside Iran who were basically, they said they were separatists, but my understanding was that um, they were uh, just economic refugees in the country. But again, that's that's not an issue. Um, that's not something that I can, I, I, I want to focus on. I don't, I don't, the Pakistanis say one thing, the Iranians say something else. But in any case, after the Iranian drone strike and the Pakistani response, the two sides immediately sat down together and uh, the Pakistani government promised to um, to do something about the border. So the relationship right now is is, is is back to normal. It's uh, quite good. Uh, of course, that peace pipeline that you're alluding to um, is has been blocked because of the United States. They've threatened Pakistan for many years. And uh, if that pipeline uh, had been finished, it would have been very beneficial for Pakistan. It would have been very good for Iran too, but for Pakistan in particular, having cheap energy under these circumstances, uh, it would have had huge benefits for the country.
But uh, so far, the the pipeline hasn't uh, it hasn't been completed, and the Pakistanis are still trying to figure out if they can finish their side without having the Americans sanction them. Uh, that's highly highly doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can do anything without a sanction from the United States. Um, so you kind of got ahead of me, but I do want to talk a little bit about the attack in Iran and the attack in Moscow. Um, because I've spoken to Scott Ritter, I've spoken to Mark Sloboda, I've spoken to a couple of analysts about the Russia attack. Um, they all say this: there's no way this is ISIS-K, this is no way this is ISKP, they don't behave in this way, they don't look this way, they don't talk this way, they don't attack this way. Uh, they're all saying it's obviously Ukraine. Um, but what are what are you what do you see in when you compare the attacks in Moscow and the attacks that you've seen from ISIS K in the past? Do they do they look the same, or do, are, are things not all as they seem, or what's kind of going on here? Okay, well, I, I I'll have to bore your <laughs> audience for a couple of minutes and briefly go through a bit of history. Uh, ISIS was a part of Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda grew in Afghanistan and Pakistan when the United States, before actually the Soviet invasion, Brzezinski and Carter decided to fund uh, radical groups, let's say, or extremist groups, or jihadists, or whatever you you want to call, we, anyone wants to call them, in Afghanistan to provoke the Soviet Union to invade. Uh, this is doc, well documented. Brzezinski also did an interview years later, and he's he was very proud of this. So, after this began and the Soviet Union invaded, Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda began to grow in Afghanistan and alongside the Pakistani border with Afghanistan, with U.S. support and Saudi support and uh, British support and so on. So fast we fast forward later on, of course, Al Qaeda um, was again used by Western powers. I want to skip 9-11. It was again used after the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening or the Islamic Awakening, whatever one wants to call it. Uh, it was used to overthrow governments. And West the West, alongside their regional partners in the Persian Gulf, they and Turkey, they began using these extremist groups in Libya to overthrow uh, the government. And of course, Libya today is a is a destroyed country thanks to NATO and its regional partners, and of course Syria, but also Yemen. But in the case of Syria, what happened was that Al Qaeda in Syria. Uh, it um, it split. So in in Syria and Iraq, Al Qaeda there was Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, there was Al Qaeda in Iraq. Ultimately, it became this. It became um, uh, uh, well. Let me put it this way: Al we had Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then when the dirty war in Syria began, it began to grow in Syria as well. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Nusra Front. Nusra Front. And then Al Qaeda um, uh, in Iraq decided to make them one. They said, "Okay, we're going to be one. We're going to have one name, and it's going to be the Islamic um, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State for Iraq and Syria, or the Iraq and Levant, right? ISIL or ISIS." But the branch in Syria refused to accept being part of ISIS. So there was a split between Al in Al-Qaeda, ISIS and the Nusra Front. And then Al-Qaeda Central sided with this, the Nusra Front. They said, <laughs> okay, you, you stay separate. And then after that, ISIS became, uh, they broke away with Al-Qaeda altogether. They said, okay, we don't accept you anymore. I don't know if I explained this well. Yeah, no, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't. So, and this, by the way, was very fortunate because ISIS and um, the Nusra Front, which right now is 
هیئت تحریر شام را اچ تی اس آی سپوز دی هاد کانسنت بیٹلز اینڈ دیٹ ویکن دیم اینڈ ایٹ ریلی ہیلپ دا دا سیرین گورنمنٹ اینڈ آلسو ہیلپ دی راکی گورنمنٹ بیکاز دیز ڈفرنٹ ایکسٹریمس گروپس بیکڈ بائی دا ویسٹ اینڈ کنٹریز ان دا پرژین گلف دے ور ایٹ ایچ ادر تھروٹس ایٹ ٹائمز اینڈ سو دے کوڈن فوکس کمپلیٹلی آن Damascus or Baghdad and and elsewhere. But in any case, so ISIS was created and ISIS was funded by these countries in the region and by Turkey and by NATO. So, uh, and we have to remember, so ISIS, first it was a part of Al-Qaeda and we have an email Uh, that was written on the 12th of uh, February 2012 by Jake Sullivan, who is now the National Security Advisor for Biden. Uh, he wrote to Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State at that time, saying that in Syria, Al-Qaeda is on our side. Right. So in Syria, Al-Qaeda, back then there was no ISIS, they were the same, Was they were working with Americans. And a lot of their cooperation was done through third parties, like the the um, uh, the different so-called secular Syrian, uh, you know, the Free Syrian Army people. <laughs> it was it was never a real army. They were basically uh, the people who gave out the weapons. The, the Americans and the Europeans and others. They would and the and the countries in the Persian Gulf and Turkey and Jordan. Jordan, of course, was more passive, but they they allowed this to happen. They would give the gun, the weapons to the Free Syrian Army people, and then the Free Syrian Army people would give it to ISIS and, um, sorry, to Al Qaeda. Back then, there wasn't ISIS yet. Al Qaeda and uh, the other groups. So the West helped build Al Al Qaeda. Then, of course, when Al Qaeda split and ISIS grew. They were also supported as well. In fact, there was a young reporter for Press TV uh, back then called Serena Sheen, and she was reporting from the border between Syria and Turkey, and she was saying how ISIS and Turkish intelligence were using world, uh, I think it was world um, UN trucks. Uh, affiliated to the World Food Program um, to send in troops and weapons into Syria. So Turkish intelligence, of course, backed by countries in the Persian, oil-rich countries in the Persian Gulf and Western countries, they, uh, they were uh, sending in weapons to support ISIS. And then she was killed. Uh, Uh, she was threatened by Turkish intelligence. She actually went on TV to say, I've been threatened. And hours later, she was killed. Um, and it's everyone, people believe that Turkish intelligence killed her. But in, 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 in any case. So um, then there was also a document uh, that came out, uh, which belonged to the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. and. Um, That document in 2012 said that basically U.S. allies in the region, they wanted to create a Salafist entity between Syria and Iraq to break the uh, uh, the, uh, the the to separate the two countries from each other and to help isolate Syria. And uh, later on, the head of the defense, U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency at that time. He later, in an interview, General Michael Flynn, who you've heard of and your audience knows of, did an interview on Al Jazeera of all places and said that the U.S. under Obama took a willful decision to support this policy. So this, who who was ultimately this Salafist entity? It was I was ISIS, because ISIS held the territory between Syria and Iraq. So Al Qaeda was created by the West and its allies like Saudi Arabia for the Soviet Union. Then it was used later on in Libya and in Syria, Yemen and elsewhere to undermine enemies of the United States. 
Then in Syria, it was also, as I said, used against the Syrian government, but it split. So we had ISIS on one side and Al-Qaeda, which was the Nusra Front back then, uh, on the other. So as Jake Sullivan admitted, Al-Qaeda was on their side. So back then, ISIS being a part of Al-Qaeda was on their side. Later on, when they split, according to U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document, that uh, the, the ISIS was that entity that regional countries were trying to create. Why am I saying all this? ISIS and Al-Qaeda from the very beginning were deeply infiltrated and influenced by Western powers. Always. ISIS is has never what well, even at its height was never a centralized organization. It didn't have a command structure like, let's say, the US government or the Chinese government or the Iranian government, where you have a central authority. There are tribes and groups, and they have uh and they and they have allegiance to, to ISIS, but you know, it's spread out and there's a lot of autonomy. And so different tribes and different groups had different loyalties or they were influenced by different players. And the West was supporting this. They were, they were allowing ISIS to export oil to Turkey. Turkey was importing oil from ISIS. There, were, there would be thousands of tankers that would take oil from Syria to Turkey through, from those areas that were taken by ISIS. And um, U.S. planes would fly over and do nothing. Only after Iran convinced the Russians to enter the fight in Syria did the Russian Air Force begin bombing these uh, tankers. Thousands of tankers. Many thousands of tankers. Maybe, I don't know, tens of thousands of tankers. I don't know the numbers. Many thousands of these. <laughs> that would go directly to Turkey or for, to Erbil and, and from there to Turkey. So ISIS was exporting oil to a NATO country and to Kurdish Iraq, which was where the Americans had huge influence. So the West was supporting them. Countries in the Persian Gulf were supporting them. And tens of thousands of foreign fighters came into uh, Syria through Turkey, a NATO country. And they were facilitated by Western intelligence agencies. Oh. ISIS may exist today, right? So I, I, I know that what's the debate that's going on over what happened in Moscow. ISIS may exist today. ISIS may have carried out the attack. But that doesn't mean that since ISIS carried out the attack that the West wasn't involved or that Ukraine wasn't involved. So these may have actually been people that ISIS gathered, whether in Iran or in Moscow, but someone else was asking ISIS to do this or funding ISIS to do this. Because remember, ISIS is fragmented and uh, it's very weak and it's broken. It's not like it was before. It's had historically, as I said earlier, both as Al-Qaeda, but later as ISIS, heavily influenced by many countries. And uh, all of those, all of the attacks that we've seen, all of almost all of the major attacks have been against countries that have problems with the United States. There have been a couple of instances, for example, in Paris, uh, where there was an attack. But for the most part, and especially in recent years, all of the major attacks have been carried out in Iran, in Russia, in Syria, in places where. Um, where there are governments that are critical of the United States or the United States considers them to be adversaries. So ISIS can be involved, but that doesn't mean that if ISIS involve, is involved, that, uh, let's say, the Ukrainian intelligence is not. And um, especially, I mean, even the Turkish government recently, they were saying that foreign powers could have been in involved in in what happened in Russia of course i think the turks have a the turkish government has a sort of selfish interest here because they are uh they could easily be accused to, as being 
uh, a part of this because ISIS has a, a very long relationship with Turkey, a long-standing relationship, and they've cooperated together for years during the height of ISIS. So maybe the Turks want to say it wasn't us, and and since their relationship with Russia is somewhat problematic nowadays, but in any case. Uh, even the Turks are saying that uh, this couldn't have been done by just a, 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 a number of, uh, you know, without the help of a, a foreign and in major intelligence agency. Well, absolutely not. And I don't know if you heard, but right before the attack, at least one of the attackers was in Istanbul <laughs> on vacation. And I know that one of them, when they got caught, did mention Idlib. Um, it kind of just seemed too perfect for them to be caught and say, I was trained in northern Syria. But, you know, we're ISIS, I swear, we're ISIS. But yeah, so Turkey's probably doing what it can to get out in front of it, especially since that yeah. tenuous relation between Russia, uh, as we all know about the the grain deal falling apart. So now we'll, we'll finally... Yeah, and, 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 and Idlib is a place where all sorts of terror groups are there. And it's like a the Americans... Yeah, and the Americans and the Tur and the Americans want it, and Turkey is preserving it. So, and all of and the, the attacks carried out in Iran, as I said, and and elsewhere, you all everywhere you look, there is a link to Idlib. Uh, and tomorrow, it, these people will be used for Central Asia. They'll be used for Afghanistan. They'll be used wherever the Americans want to use them because these they're they're funded. They sustain the, who who funds them in Idlib. They have, you know, countries in the Persian Gulf, NATO. Exactly. They're the and and of course Israel. Uh, they've had a historic relationship with ISIS and Al Qaeda. Both ISIS and Al Qaeda have had bases alongside the Golan Heights for years. And every time the Syrian army would try to take that land back from ISIS or Al Qaeda, well, as I said, they were side by side. The Israeli regime would bomb. Turkey, uh, the, uh, Syrian forces. They they would use uh, artillery. They would use tanks, and they would also, as I think many know, uh, they would treat their injured in uh, Israeli hospitals. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> ISIS is, uh, you know, when some people say these Islamic jihadists, um, I I I find that to be. Um, uh, not accurate. These are American jihadists. These are, you know, <laughs> these are they're, our, they're my jihadists. Yeah, yeah they're NATO jihadists. Whether it's uh, you know, they're, they've they've been doing their bidding for over forty years. Now we could talk about nine eleven, but nine eleven aside, and you know whatever happened there, uh, you know whatever happened on nine eleven. We know that a decade later, a decade after 9-11, the Americans were in bed with Al-Qaeda. And again, mm -hmm. as I said, later on, uh, ISIS, it, it was, it was Al-Qaeda, and later on it separated. A decade later, in order to undermine Libya and Syria, the Americans were using Al-Qaeda. So what does that say about 9-11, or what does that say about uh, the United States? That's for your viewers uh, to think about. But in any case, these are NATO jihadists. That's and, a great uh, way to look at it because they really don't have ideology. I've re read and seen interviews with a lot of these terror groups from the northern uh, northern Syria. And one that really struck me was the guys from Turkestan. Uh, the the Uyghurs who were saying, I don't I don't even know who I'm killing. I'm just here to get trained so I can go back to China. And so it's like just this little terror factory that just creates these <laughs> separatists to go back to countries that the United States doesn't like or to to complicate resources that the United States doesn't want other countries to use. So yeah, it's and that's uh, the huge reason why northern Syria is we've got such a death grip on it. Well, actually. Ideologically speaking, many are like that, but also the ideology itself was, you know, it, Salafism and Wahhabism has its own history. But Muhammad uh, ibn Abdul Wahhab was influential in a small part of Saudi Arabia in Najd, and back then Saudi Arabia was that land was very impoverished. So later on, when the Americans wanted to deploy to create these groups, they 
used that ideology. It was the Saudis that promoted Wahhabism and 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 Salafism alongside the Americans. And in fact, uh, in Afghanistan uh, during the Dirty War in the 1980s. Back then, the Saudis didn't have the sort of capabilities that it has now. So the Americans actually published their takfiri literature. I think I think it was the University of Nebraska oh. that published their text. I think your viewers should look this up. I think it's <laughs> I think it's the University of Nebraska that first began to publish these books. They would be sent to Pakistan so for, so for school students or young people and, and so on to read and to make them takfiri and uh, hostile towards uh, the Russians or the Soviets. And so Wahhabism was an obscure ideology which became very influential thanks to this alliance between NATO and Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Persian Gulf. And they spread this ideology across the board uh, in different parts of the world. So it wasn't widespread, but it became very influential. And uh, I don't want to cause anyone trouble, but even in, um, you know, uh, Western governments allowed them to be very influential in their own countries. Absolutely. Um, and another book is The Ghost Wars that is really interesting. And it talks about how America came in and set up those schools and then helped publish the materials from Saudi. So exactly what you're talking about. Um, now we'll finally switch to the Levant, which I'm sure everybody is wanting us to talk about uh, what's actually going on. So I don't know if you've noticed I exist online probably too much. But in, on this, in the social media sphere, we, we're seeing a concerted effort to really delegitimize Iran uh, and the entire axis of resistance for kind of these hokey sort of Jordan did an airdrop of aid and like just silly, silly things. So, but every time anybody from Hamas speaks, they thank Iran, they thank Hezbollah. Um, but the rhetoric in the Arab diaspora that condemns Iran and suggests they aren't helping enough or are, it's kind of funny, I can't believe I'm saying this, or are even hurting Gazans to further the, their own interests in Iran. Um, we obviously disagree. But to those who might not, could you give us some expansion on what ways Iran really supports the resistance uh, lately? Well, first, I have to point out that a lot of this is understandable because for decades, the anti-Iranian propaganda, both in the Arab media, which is almost universally state-owned, directly or indirectly, uh, has been very extensive. So both there have been both racial elements to it, but also sectarian elements to it. Uh, a lot of uh, strange beliefs and ideas have been attributed, for example, to Shias uh, through this media, to their uh, Sunni audience. So they try to create these divisions and hatred and animosity through fake news, through dishonest analysis and, and, and spreading um, disinformation. Uh, and the same is true in the Western media. What I would, I think is, you know, to, 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 because I don't want to go into detail, uh, I think that the latest episode, or let's say the last few months of Gaza, has shown how dishonest the corporate media, the mainstream Western media, state media is in the West. I think that's become uh, common knowledge that Western media is completely dishonest. They are uh, um, a genocide is taking place in front of a global audience. And they are either uh, whitewashing the Israeli actions, or they're supporting Israel, or they're looking away. And I think we all know that now. So my all I can say is that taking that into account, then I think it's best to rethink everything that people have heard about Iran. Whatever people have heard about Iran over the last four decades, you have to look at it uh again you have to you have to you have to uh take what's happened over the last few months and how the western media has behaved into consideration and then rethink iran so iran is not what people think it is it is a very 
normal country. It uh, is a country that has been through great difficulty. After the revolution, the Americans have imposed, they imposed the war. The Americans and the uh, Europeans and these oil-rich dictatorships in the Persian Gulf, they supported Saddam Hussein. They gave him chemical weapons. They gave him the military intelligence to use those chemical weapons and the political cover to get away with using chemical weapons. I survived two chemical attacks myself. Many, many died, both Iraqis because he used it against his own people and, and Iranians. Many, many, many thousands uh, died. And many died a slow death. It took years for them to die. And some are still dying because it's a, you know, for some it just gets worse and worse. But in any case, so, you know, these crimes against the Iranian people uh, also kept the country back. And then after the war, we had the sanctions. And the sanctions against Iran over the last few decades have all been about Palestine. Everything that you hear about Iran, all of the sanctions, the excuse, whether it's about human rights or the nuclear program or terrorism, uh, the real reason behind all of this is Palestine and Iran's policy towards Palestine and Iran's support for Palestine. And have no doubt, if Iran abandoned its support for the Palestinian people, the sanctions would go away. I mean, imagine right now what the Americans would be willing to offer to Iran for Iran to just stop supporting the Palestinian people. Just imagine what they would be willing to do at this moment. So, so Iran has made significant sacrifices over the de decades for the Palestinian people, and they've never, they've never betrayed them, they never backstabbed them, even during moments when some of the Palestinian factions, or at least elements within some of the Palestinian factions, were fooled into thinking that the uh, some of the groups in Syria were really independent and fighting for the Syrian people. Uh, Iran continued to support them in the Palestinian cause, even though the Iranians uh, were against the position of those individuals or some, you know, some individuals and some groups uh, towards Syria. These people made a big mistake. Now, now I think it's become clear what happened in Syria. We all, I think anyone who's fair-minded would know. Uh, now, some may say, well, the Syrian government is they don't they hate some may hate the Syrian government. But regardless of what they think about the Syrian government, uh I, I've been to Syria many times uh from 2000, I think late 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I I, I would go every year for uh three, four times three, four times a year. Uh, I go to universities. Students, some of them like love Pre President Assad, some of them liked him, some of them were indifferent, some of them it was clear that they didn't like him. But they didn't want the, the the terrorist groups. They didn't want the extremists. They didn't want those groups that the West and the oil-rich dictatorships in the Persian Gulf were supporting. It was clear as day. It was obvious. I, I you know, anyone who frequented Syria could tell. So, uh, and of course, if, if the if the Syrian government didn't have support against these groups, it wouldn't have been able to uh, survive. Because, I mean, how much could Iran, I mean, this Russians came in in 2015. How, how much could Iran help Syria if the whole country was against the government? It would have fallen, especially since all, almost all the surrounding governments were supporting the extremist groups. So in any case, um, the Iranians continued to support the, the Palestinian resistance against the Israelis um, during, during the last couple of decades. And even though Iran doesn't decide on behalf of the Palestinian group, so on October the 7th, Iran was not involved in the decision-making process to carry out the attack, which in my opinion is was a completely legitimate attack. I mean, I've, um, from the very first, some of our mutual friends contacted me and we did programs together. Uh, they were saying, you know, they were, they were cautious and I was saying, no, it was completely legitimate. Uh, of course, now they're more, um, I think every, 
I think any fair-minded person understands that it was a legitimate attack. And many of the claims made by the Israelis turned out to be lies. But in any case, uh, you know, people in the death camp or the concentration camp called Gaza, who were expelled from their lands, they hit back after decades of sub subjugation and uh, after being ethnically cleansed. Uh, if it was the French resistance, the West would call them heroic. But since mm -hmm. they're Palestinians, they are... You know, they're terrorists. But in any case, the point is that uh, Iran obviously was deeply involved in the defense capabilities of the resistance, without a doubt. Uh, without <laughs> Iran's support, there would be no resistance in Gaza or in Yemen or in Lebanon or elsewhere. And so their defense capabilities have everything to do with the heroic uh Def, uh, defenders of Gaza, and, but also due to the fact that the Iranians have been helping them create their infrastructure and their defense capabilities. So the Iranians have made many sacrifices, but again, because of the anti-Iranian propaganda that we've been seeing for decades, um, many people, it's very difficult for them to think beyond uh, the the the, uh, the narratives that have been so powerful. And as I said, many of those narratives were built upon uh, race and sectarianism and uh, all sorts of disinformation. But gradually things are changing because I remember when Yemen was being attacked, bombed day and night, similar to Gaza, and they were also being starved, uh, similar to Gaza, um, there was very little sympathy for them. And uh, Ansarullah, or what the West likes to call the Houthis, Ansarullah, they were on their own. And uh, a lot of people in our region and beyond did not care for them. But now, many of these people see them as the heroes of you know the the region or the Arab world, so I think uh, things are changing. I, I think so. I think you're right. Um, so this also kind of goes on along with those sort of those, those breaking in the in the Palestinian resistance movement. The Prime Minister of Palestine uh, presented his cabinet. I think it was two days ago. So this is the new government under uh, Prime Minister Mustafa. It's opposed by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. I don't know about the PFLP or the DFLP. I haven't seen anything. But we've also heard from Palestinians who have expressed concern over this new government, um, worried that they'll take the agency away from Hamas and take over the Gaza Strip, uh, at least administratively, if not in a demilitarized fashion. What do you think of this new cabinet and, and how will it's the relations with the fact with Iran change? From the very beginning, when the war in Gaza entered this new phase, because the war has been going on for decades. This is nothing. Nothing began on October the 7th. October the 7th was just a new chapter in this uh, in this conflict of where the Israelis I, again, your audience knows this, but I just a reminder: the Israelis ethnically cleansed these people, put them in this concentration camp, surrounded it, and periodically they carry out massacres. And the West never cared, uh, and they don't care now, as we see. And I mean, regimes, Western regimes. So, uh, from the beginning, a lot of our friends, uh, many of them, as I said. Those who were influenced by anti-Iranian narratives would, co would contact it. Would contact me and say, "What's you know, Gaza will fall." My understanding from the very beginning, from people who have knowledge, was that Gaza wasn't going to fall. And I think the information that I was fed, well, not fed, but the information that was given to me, turned out to be very accurate. And uh, Gaza is not going to fall. And therefore, the United States and the Israeli regime and their allies are not going to get their way in Gaza. And the resistance will continue. They are prepared for a very long war. 
they are not running out of ammunition. They are building new tunnels as we speak. They're increasing their stockpiles as we speak. And they have new recruits or getting new recruits as we speak. Uh, their defense capabilities are um, preserved. And the Israeli regime is not going to be able to uh, overcome them. It's, they're not going to be vanquished. And ultimately, uh, I think that it's uh, the Americans and the Israelis that their over-the-top demands uh, are going to continue to be met with scorn. And uh, they're going to have to be more realistic. The world has changed. And uh, Gaza is not alone. The resistance front in Lebanon will continue to make sacrifices to uh, support Gaza. In Yemen, they will continue to make sacrifices. And if the Americans push too hard, they'll, they now know that their, their foothold in Iraq and Syria will be lost if they, if they get directly involved. So, and Iran supports the resistance. Iran doesn't hide this. Uh, Iran will continue to support the Palestinian people. Uh, we have to remember that when the revolution in Iran took place, there are two key foreign policy issues that were close to the heart of uh, the revolutionaries. Um, before the revolution, during the revolution, and after. One was South Africa and the struggle against apartheid, and the second was Palestine. When the revolution happened, Iran broke off ties with the Israeli regime and with apartheid South Africa. And Iran began to fund the resistance organizations in Palestine and in South Africa. So the ANC military wing was supported and funded by Iran. Whereas the West considered the ANC to be a terrorist organization. Yep. In, in fact, the ANC was a terrorist organization according to U.S. law. And Nelson Mandela was a terrorist according to U.S. law. Mm -hmm. And only after, only after he, his presidency was over, in other words, he was president of South Africa, and he was still and they, he and the ANC were still terrorists, according mm -hmm. to U.S. law. <laughs> I think it was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, again, so your viewers can look this up. In 2012, did, did they finally remove uh, the ANC and Nelson Mandela from their terror list? So Iran was supporting the terrorists in South Africa, meaning the liberation <laughs> organizations, <laughs> And it's doing the same in Palestine. The same uh, liberation organizations that were in South, that back then were terrorists in South Africa, Western countries have been pretending to be friends with for, for decades now. And uh, Iran will continue to support, the, even though Iran is alone, even though Turkey, Mr. Erdogan has, you know, betrayed the cause, he, does business with Israel. He's unwilling to do anything for the uh, Palestinian people in Gaza, or you know, or Jordan, or the Emirates, or others. Even though they um, refuse to pay a price, but Iran is willing to pay a price, and it has been paying a heavy price for decades now. And so are other movements and governments in the region, like the Yemeni government. And movements such as Hezbollah and its allies in uh, Lebanon, because Hezbollah is not alone. Uh, uh, different parties in Lebanon support the resistance from all religious and um, uh, different religions and sects. And fortunately, the resistance is growing today. I would argue that the resistance in Europe and North America <laughs> is enormous. Uh, many young Jews today are at the forefront of the resistance against uh, apartheid and uh, ethno supremacism in Palestine, just as uh, many young people in Europe and in North America uh, during the height of apartheid in South Africa were at the forefront of resistance uh, against, uh, against the supremacist regime in South Africa too. Well, I mean, 
Erdogan did do something wonderful for the whole world this year. He announced that he won't be running for office again. So Erdogan, thank you for not running for office again <laughs> and retiring from politics. Um, earlier this week, we had another ceasefire vote, and this one finally went through only because the United States is mad at Bibi. Um, so uh, the United States immediately after called it non-binding. So Algeria, Malta, Mozambique, and Sierra Leone, they submitted objections saying that it is binding, Regardless, Israel has continued to bomb and it has no intention of abiding by it. Um, they blamed this ceasefire for causing Hamas to walk away from negotiations on their ceasefire. Um, do you think it's becoming clearer that Israel will not be stopped by legal or diplomatic means? And do you think that other countries will be more open to taking some sort of physical or tangible action? Well, first of all, there's I don't believe there's any major division between uh, Israel and the United States. And no, no, the, they were just a little bit mad at Bibi about other stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what 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 I meant to say was that the United States was under enormous pressure, both because of what I call the resistance at home, and many young people. Uh, now turning against the Israeli regime and seeing it for what it is, uh, an illegitimate ethno-supremacist uh, regime. Uh, but also internationally, the United States has become deeply isolated. The whole of the West has, the collective West has become deeply isolated, but the United States is also deeply isolated. So the United States had to take that position under duress. And as you rightly pointed out, they said it's non-binding, but of course, by saying that, they undermine the UN Security Council because now anyone can say that all, uh, you know, any resolution is is non-binding. Uh, but in any case, I think it was still important. You're right. I agree. I believe that it's not going to have an impact on the behavior of the Israeli regime. This is a brutal, genocidal regime that will continue with these crimes against humanity. And the United States will fund it. They will continue to send weapons, as we see. The British will send weapons. Uh, Europe will continue to uh, refrain from sanctioning them, and they will give them aid, and they'll do trade with them and try to help them as much as possible without um, being seen, because the Europeans sort of like to, you know, they don't want to be seen as like the Americans supporting uh, genocide, but they're all in it together. The Australian government or the regime in Australia, all of them are in this together. They're collectively carrying out this Holocaust. But uh, th this is still important because it shows that the pressure is building. Just as the um, International Court of Justice, we knew that nothing was going to happen. Uh, but it was still an important event because it 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 was it strengthened the uh, the people the position the, uh, of the people of Palestine. It isolated the United States. It isolated Britain and France and Canada and Germany, and it showed them to lack any. It showed them as lacking any morality. So all of these events, whether in the UN Security Council or in the General Assembly or the um, uh, ICJ or elsewhere, all of these have an impact. It puts more pressure on the Israeli regime and its allies. But at the end of the day, it is going to be the resistance on the ground that defeats uh, the Israeli regime. It is going to be Hamas, Islamic Jihad, their other allies, their allies in Gaza and in the West Bank. It's going to be uh, Yemen. It's going to be Hezbollah. It's going to be the resistance in Iraq and Syria. And of course, Iran, uh, which is going to be supporting all of them. They will continue to play their role until the Israeli regime recognizes that um, it will have to stop uh, the genocide for for the sake of its own survival. But of course, I should add that the most important heroes are the are the people of Gaza, uh, the women, the children, the men who remain steadfast despite the horrific uh, suffering that they've been enduring, the starvation that the regime and their Western allies have been imposing on them by cutting UN aid uh, and the 
the military support that the West has been giving to them, the political cover that the Western media and Western governments have been giving to them. Despite all that, these people uh, and, and the suffering that has resulted as a, because of all this, um, despite that, despite all this, these people have remained steadfast. And uh, I think without them, Hamas, Hezbollah, Ansar Allah, Islamic Jihad, Iran, and all the other resistance groups, the Hashid in Iraq and in Syria, they couldn't have uh, they couldn't have put the Israeli regime in such a a, a horrific uh, military and political situation. It was it had it, without the people of Gaza, this would have been impossible. Last question. Um, the the invasion of Rafah, it's kind of been looming over our heads. We have about a million and a half, maybe 1.7 million refugees there in, in a makeshift fly-by-night camp. Do you think that the invasion of Rafah is going to occur? If it occurs, what kind of response should we expect from the Arab countries or the axis of resistance? Is this a red line for anybody or or do you think it, that we're just using this as an empty threat and it won't happen? Well, the Israeli regime has two options. One is Lebanon and one is Rafah, or both. If Israel attacks Lebanon, they will be devastated. Hezbollah does not want to expand the war because Hezbollah doesn't want, it wants to preserve unity in Lebanon, right? So Hezbollah is, in, is playing a very, uh, is in, is playing a very complicated role. On the one hand, they're striking out at Israel to prevent the Israeli regime from using all of its forces in Gaza. It's keeping half of its, it's forced to keep half of its forces in the north. But on the other hand, it doesn't want to expand the war so that people in Lebanon don't turn against the resistance. But if the Israeli regime expands the war in Lebanon, then Hezbollah has an excuse to hit very hard. They will destroy Israeli infrastructure. They will destroy its gas installations. They will bring down the Israeli economy. The Israelis can only kill ordinary people and bomb homes. Lebanon doesn't have much of an infrastructure. Israel has a lot that can be destroyed. They have a lot to lose. And Hezbollah will do it. And they have the means and the capability. So if they attack Lebanon, they will lose. They will be, they will be far worse than anything that they have ever experienced before. Rafa is another option. The Israeli regime has already lost in Gaza. It is looking for a path to victory. And so, either, either you know, because they've, they've been defeated. The greatest defeat, of course, is the fact that they've been exposed. They've been exposed to the world as genocidal and criminal, and Ill and morally illegitimate. That is the greatest defeat. That they've brought upon themselves by massacring so many people. But the military defeat, of course, uh, is is has also been key. They they've lost the war in Gaza. But if so, so they are looking for a path to victory. It either goes through Lebanon or through Rafah. But it's only going to make the defeat worse if they attack Lebanon. It's going to make it much worse but if they attack Lebanon. But if they attack Rafah, what happens? Rafah, it's much. The, the, the Israelis, they've been attacking the north of Gaza. Central Gaza. They, they we for for months now we've been hearing about the attacks and so on. And from the beginning, they 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 were we were told that they're taking Gaza. They've split it in two, or they split it in three, and they. But as we speak, the regime has not been able to control Gaza City in the north. And even when they carried out this new atrocity in. The Al Shifa Hospital, we saw that the resistance has been attacking them from all sides. So they failed in Ga in the south. The, the 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 Israeli regime would have to go. Uh, would have the in the north. The north is much more vulnerable to the Israelis. I think it's like four kilometers wide. 
In the South, I think it's something like between 12 and 14, again, your viewers can look it up, 12 to 14 kilometers wide. So the Israelis would have a much tougher job moving into Rafah. And on the other hand, the world is, cannot tolerate these atrocities. As some people say the Israelis can continue forever and nothing will happen. I don't agree with that. Already, the regime has lost its legitimacy in the eyes of the global community. And anger is building up. Remember, in, in a decade and a half ago, um, people thought that this region was quiet, North Africa and West Asia was quiet and stable, and the de despots were all, you know, very well entrenched. And then some young man in Tunisia, he 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 killed himself because mm -hmm. of. The, you know, because how he 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 was being oppressed and he was being abused, and it led to the overthrow of multiple governments. So, it, when people in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Egypt, and elsewhere, when they have to sit and watch all this happen, there the anger builds up. So, the more atrocities committed by the Israeli regime the more dangerous it becomes for the regime itself. And the more unstable become these, these uh, client regimes of the United States. And the more isolated the West and, and the United States in particular becomes. So in my opinion, in my personal opinion, even though we all want an immediate ceasefire, but the regime that needs a ceasefire more than anyone else is the Israeli regime. Every day that this war continues, it is worse for the Israeli regime. Mm -hmm. True, they're massacring women and children. True, every morning we wake up to the news of more massacres. That's correct. And it's, you know, it's very, it's very painful for all of us. But, but of course, all liberation movements gave major sacrifices. In Algeria, uh, over a million people were killed by the French until they achieved mm -hmm. independence. If you want independence, if you want sovereignty, if you want digni dignity, you have to pay a price because the West, these regimes, not the people, we see, as I said, people uh, coming to the defense of the Palestinian people across the Western world. But these regimes, they are utterly brutal. They have no morality. They, are, they lack any decency. They are utterly evil. We've, they've exposed themselves in Gaza. This is an unprecedented genocide in human history. Why? Because it's taking place in front of our eyes. Oh and in front as it's happening, they are continuing to support these this genocide, this this Holocaust. So they've 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 destroyed themselves. I won't say they've diminished themselves, they've destroyed themselves. The Israeli regime needs a, a ceasefire. Uh, it needs it today, but it's too foolish and too extremist mm -hmm. and it's and its people are too sick to recognize mm -hmm. what they're doing to themselves. But uh, but I'm very optimistic uh, about uh, the future. And I hope that there is a ceasefire. But whether the Israelis expand in Rafah, whether it's a limited uh, attack or a major attack, or whether they expand in Lebanon, uh, it's 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 just a path to greater defeat, and uh, ultimately, I do not believe that the Israeli regime, the Zionist project, will last much longer. I don't know if it'll end in in two years or ten years, but this uh, regime, after what it's done uh, to the people of Palestine, uh, it has no place in West Asia, and the only solution for uh, Palestine is for a single state where everyone lives as equal human beings, whether Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, where ethno-supremacism is cast aside completely 
And I'm not saying South Africa is some utopia. South Africa has huge problems, but at least it is no longer an ethno supremacist state. So I can't that is only way forward. I can't think of a better note to end on than a hopeful outlook for the end of Israel and the beginning of a one state under the flag of Palestine, uh, hopefully on in our lifetime. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, any closing thoughts and let our listeners know where they can find you, what you're working on, where they can see more of you. Well, I'm, I only have a Twitter account. I've been removed <laughs> from Facebook and Instagram a long time ago, and I haven't bothered to return. Uh, so uh, that's that's it basically. I I have some interviews like like the one with yourself on that they may be able to find on YouTube or Rumble or elsewhere. Well, then we'll but, have to um, make more content. But um, uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I hope all of your viewers uh, they continue to remain very active uh, in their support for the Palestinian people. This is not going to end tomorrow, and we um, should always keep the Palestinian people uh, as a top priority. And even though we all we all have things to do, we have to make time for them every day to put to increase the pressure against those forces that are supporting the genocide in Gaza. Well, thank you. And thank all of our listeners for coming. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Please visit the website. We are still doing collections for Yemen. We did an aid drop yesterday, I believe, in Hodaida. So please visit the website for options to contribute or, or work together and collaborate. And once again, thank you to Professor Morandi. It's been another episode of the DD Geopolitics live stream. <laughs>